people come inside, you've got such green fingers, like that you've never killed a plant in your life. <laughs> um, I could just say to people, you just need to grow plants and kill plants. The more you learn, the more you kill. Um, <laughs> Callum Grossis Overdam. It's got a, uh, it's a variegation again. Um, so it's got a white, white midrib. You get very little downtime. It is a 11 months a year sort of a plant. I've got three different types of Penelias. This is um, Penelia cordata, um, and this is the purple form. Um, we call it the miniature dragon, is the common name, which I just think is fantastic. Actually, it smells like bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 45 of Talking Dirty, a bit of a special episode, this one. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, sporting some lovely orange accents in a jumper that's apparently from the Ark, he told me before we uh, got <laughs> properly on air. We have our very handsome horticulturalist, Alan Edward Herbert Gray. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And over in Cambridgeshire, that way, <laughs> it's the right way, believe me. I mean, it could be anywhere, I suppose. <laughs> that way, south of me, we have Thordis. <laughs> I always want to get this wrong. Thordis Maria Sophia Friedrichsen. <laughs> Looking wonderful, smiling and happy and cheering us up on this. Well, it's a little bit overcast here today. It's brightly overcast, I would, I would say. Um, and I'm looking forward to what's coming up. Oh, so am I. If it's overcast when you are sitting down to watch this or to listen to it, don't worry. The clouds will soon be parted by the sunshine of both our guest and the plant she's got to talk about. It is an auricular special today. We're welcoming back uh, Jane and Walton, who we talked about auriculars with last time, but it wasn't auricular season when we uh, welcomed you to Talking Dirty, Jane Anne. So we are super excited. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah, quite enjoying this cool spring because it's really suiting the auriculars. That's true. <laughs> Though uh, the rain, not necessarily quite so much now that it's arrived. No. no. <laughs> and for people who are listening to the audio version, you're missing out on how well themed Jane Ann's outfit is. So she has a crocheted auricular brooch. I feel like the scarf has got a bit of a ruffle double auricular thing going on. And actually yeah. off camera, you've got an auricular themed mug as well. I have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Also, we must talk about the gorgeous flowers over your shoulder because they're not auriculars, obviously. They're not show and tell, but it kind of all themes in with the auriculars that we're talking about today. Yeah, that is a vase of English florist tulips. Um, and I've grown them for many years. Um, I've got one here, which I might be able to show you. This one is James Watt. Oh. And he dates back to 1860. And he's what's called a broken tulip, um, which means he's got tulip breaking virus, which is what causes the feathers and flames. I mean, it's, it's this white variety is never perfectly feathered and flamed and I'm not very good at getting mine to break in the way they should. But um, because they've got virus, you can't go out and buy them anywhere because people aren't allowed to sell them. So the only way to get them is to belong to the Wakefield Tulip Society, which is the oldest surviving florist society. And um, auriculas are also a florist's flower. And sort of 300 years ago, the florists were not like today's florists where you're doing flowers for weddings and funerals and parties and things. <laughs> they were growing to certain standards of perfection, which they judged among themselves. They set all these rules as to what they were aiming for. And they were breeding all these amazing plants. Um, and the main flowers that had these societies were auriculas, tulips, ranunculus, carnations, pansies and hyacinths for a little while. Um, and the auriculas and the, the tulips carry on. And if it wasn't for the societies, we really wouldn't have these flowers available. What a wonderful history. And obviously yeah. it's auriculas as well as all these other flowers. Is that part of what drew you in in the first place, the sort of the whole story around them? Um, I think I learned the story later. I just first saw auriculas years ago at a Chelsea flower show. And I just thought, wow, they just don't look real, particularly the green edged varieties. I just thought I've got to have a go. Um, I have to admit the first lot I got, I killed. <laughs> <laughs> Went a long way to buy them. Um, and I think I suffocated them in a cold frame in the winter because they look so delicate. You think, oh, you know, they've got to be protected from everything. 
probably forgot to water them as well because you know the, the advice was to keep them quite dry in the winter but I think I took that to an extreme <laughs> and, and you forget how hot a cold frame can get in the winter when it's not open you know on a sunny day so that was my sad start to auricular growing but I've been growing them now for at least 30 years probably a bit longer well, that's encouraging because it can go very, very wrong at the beginning and yet lead into an illustrious and long auricular growth lifetime. <laughs> Jane, Ann, can I ask um, very briefly, sort of, um, I mean, it's a huge subject, I know, but if, if somebody wants to grow auriculars and they don't want to start off in the way that you did, they want to have a, a modicum of success with them, what would, yeah. you, say you, what would you say, sort of like three or four um you know pinpoint three or four highlights that you must do to get um, a decent auricular to flower and, and thrive for you well I think um, you've got to look at their origins they are basically a man-made plant but the two parents are both um, mountain plants and they grow between three and eight thousand feet so they need light they need lots of air you know, which they'd get on the mountain top, yeah. and they want to be cool, particularly cool at the root. Right. And those are the three key things that I think you need to bear in mind. I've got an old book by somebody called Roy Genders. You've probably heard of this book. Yes. Um, and um, he sort of talks in there about various composts, and, and auricular growers often have their secret, shall we say, secret cake mix of compost. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> got their own compost mix it's fascinating and um because they haven't been able to have a the national society haven't been able to have shows for the last two years yeah it's actually been quite good because for those of us who don't get to the shows my nearest one is birmingham there's been a lot more information and uh the spring newsletter had a compilation of about 10 different people's compost mixes and it, it really was interesting you know and we've all got our own mix you, you cannot yeah go to a garden centre and buy a plastic bag full of compost and say, right, this is what the auriculars are going in. It doesn't work like that. And I think you're probably like me, you know, you put in a bit of this and a bit of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Basically you need a, a sort of one, one, one mix of um, horticultural grit. And I use poultry growers grit from the feed merchants, which is a nice pretty mix, a multi-purpose compost, which is going to give you a bit of moisture retention and then a loam-based compost. And when I say loam, I'm, for those that don't know, I'm talking about um, the sort of soil you'd get in a molehill, basically. Yeah. And I use a loam-based John Innes number two or three. But that mix really is important because your plant is going to be sitting in that for 12 months till you repot it again. You sort of need to try and get it right. Now you brought me on to the next question. And thank you for oh, that. No, not Pete. <laughs> don't mention Pete. No, no, no. I'm not going to mention <laughs> Pete. Um, what I was going to mention was repotting, timing. Um, I, I, I think probably it's variable with various growers, but I mean, I'd like to know what you do because you have you have great successes. We've all seen some wonderful pictures on your Instagram account. Um, so, what do you you what what time of the year do you aim to do your repotting and taking off of offsets? Usually, I do it um, at the end of the summer. And you've got to pick a time when it's not too hot, because remember, once you've repotted it and washed all the soil off the roots, the plant actually can't st start taking up water again until those roots have slightly got established. So if you do it in hot weather, it's asking a lot of the plant. Can I just, um, can I just stop you there and ask a pertinent question? Why do you wash the roots? Uh, <laughs> Well, that's the bugs. We are plagued at the moment with root aphids. To, to the uninitiated, how do you spot root, root aphid? It looks like cotton wool and yep. it's rather like a mealy bug. I think the root aphids have a little sort of cotton woolly coating on them. Um, and it tends to start around the top of what's called the carrot, which is the main sort of storage root on the auricula. Yeah. So at the bottom of the leaves, you have this carrot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which the root aphids, well, the root aphids feed on the finer roots, but you see that you see this when you're watering, you sort of pick the leaves up to try and get the water underneath the leaves and you spot this ghastly cotton wool and you think, uh oh, I've got a problem. And then really you have to, to take the plant and wash all the soil off the roots and try and get rid of these things. And you have to really brush the roots to get the eggs and the aphids off. 
and oh. then we're still sort of working on what on earth we can control them with. We're trying oh. neem oil. I don't know whether it's going to work. But the other pest we have is um, a little leaf hopper that sucks the leaves in the summer and red spider mite. And a solution of neem oil does sort that out every 10 days. So I do that as a sort of preventative, really. Is that, wow. is that used as a spray? Yes. Don't spray in the sunlight. Do it no. um, ideally late in the evening. Otherwise, they could scorch. Yeah. It is an amazing amount of dedicated work and effort, <laughs> particularly when you've got to fight on so many fronts. <laughs> yeah. The other one is vine weevil. And um, I like to repot late summer because then hopefully... I'm not sending them through the winter with vine weevil grubs chewing the roots because otherwise you come to spring and you think, oh, that plant doesn't look very well. And you touch it and it just sort of falls off the surface because the vine weevil have eaten every single root. Um, and, you know, it happens. Um, I had one whole frame of seedlings which were looking really promising. And because they were seedlings, I didn't need to repot them in the autumn. So I left them and... Uh, didn't think about the fact they were next to an old half barrel with Virginia's in and the vine weevil came out of that and got at the auriculars and I sort of lost quite a few, you know. Oh, so <laughs> so bad. Don't keep those bound relics next to your auricular frame. <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned seedlings and I, I am particularly covetous of one of your seedlings which you put up on Instagram, mm. it is a pale blue seedling. Now, that, ah. there's a pale blue and there's a, that's um. the one. It's almost luminous. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. that's absolutely. I mean, the, the great thing about that is I think it's not, well, I wouldn't say it was blue, but I mean, that maybe just the way it's showing up on my, on my screen. But the, I think the fascinating thing about it is that luminous green eye. Yes. That's wonderful. Now, did you specifically yeah. cross two parents to get that, or is it luck? I'm not that clever. I'm not not good on genetics. I, I tend to just pick flowers that I like and yeah. and save some seed and hope for the best. Yeah. Um, probably not the ideal way to do it. Well, I um, don't know. <laughs> with results like that, you know. <laughs> Going back to uh, beginners, I really would recommend joining the National Primula and Auricular Society. Um, they have some fantastic booklets, and I belong to the Midlands and West section. There are different sections. There's the Northern section and the Southern section, and I'm not sure what else. And each of them have different lots of literature, but there's a really good one of the booklets is this Beginner's Guide Um there's a one a, a little booklet about the history of auricular theatres and then about all the different types of auriculars that you can grow. So that's really worthwhile. Mm. And I know that most people watching or listening will know all about auricular theatres, but we should mention those briefly because there's sort of nothing more satisfying, surely, if you grow auriculars than being able to display them in such yeah. a way. Well, theatres, again, go back to the florists growing their auriculars and they wanted to show them off. And, um, you know, in the big gardens in the 1700s, the ladies had big dresses. They couldn't get down to the ground to sort of admire these little plants. And the, the gentlemen of the house would like to have them on show at eye level to show them off. Um, and I think the, the, the best known theatre is probably the one at Cork Abbey in mm. Derbyshire, which is a big one. It's not ideal for auriculars because, in fact, it faces southeast and it's really very hot. So I think it's quite a difficult place to keep them going. And I think there is um, a bit of a misconception amongst a lot of people that auriculars are grown in theatres. You don't really generally grow them in a theatre. You show them in a theatre. And then once they're over, you can put something else in it. Um, I put succulents in mine. Some people just have little like bookshelves on the wall. But if you're building one or ordering one, just make sure that the shelves are far enough apart because it, it looks good if you have the plants staked and they're, they're standing upright, I think, rather than leaning out into the rain. Yeah. Um, and you need quite a lot of height for that. And uh, I, my, one of my favourite posts from you the other day was how you'd been auditioning your auriculars to go in the <laughs> theatre. Yeah, I love doing that. Just picking out the nicest ones to, to put on display. And how long were you auditioning your auriculars for, Jane Ann? It took me 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 700 plants about. 
and um, you know they've all got to be sort of staked and looking <laughs> lovely it's ridiculous but you know why grow them if you can't sort of show them and enjoy them it's wonderful it really is <laughs> And, and you mentioned there are different types of auricular. I yeah. don't know in your kind of show and tell whether you want to demonstrate that or whether you just want to explain. Yeah, I do. Um, I'm sure I was going to say something else about auricular theatres, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say to that you. it's appropriate that we're, we're talking about this in Norfolk because... Um, as you probably know, the Huguenots were well known for their auricular growing and the weavers were coming to Norwich fleeing religious persecution. And tradition has it that they brought their plants with them. That's probably unlikely because if you're sort of fleeing murderous Catholics, you probably wouldn't stop to pick up your auricular plants and <laughs> pack them up. But they brought their enthusiasm and their knowledge for auriculars. Um, and one of the earliest florists feasts was actually in Norwich in 1631 or the earliest recorded ones and they got together basically in the pub and <laughs> sort of handed around their plants and had lots of food and drink and so on and they, the Huguenots also brought canaries to Norwich and their their knowledge of canary breeding which is where the, our football club got their name. Well there you go, auriculars yeah. and football, who knew they were so linked? I know, absolutely, <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> So this seedling that I showed you first is a typical border auricula. I think that's um, you can grow it in the garden. I don't. I find them so much easier in pots, really. In my garden, I have the sort of garden that's a bit of a cottage garden style jumble. And things like auriculas, they would just get smothered by other things. So if I was going to grow them in the garden, I think they'd need to be on their own in a raised bed and it would need to be a, a shady raised bed. And some of them, they would just get ruined by the rain. I mean, the, the terminology, this is a truss, the whole sort of head of flower. And then these are pips. And the pips actually have fused petals with a, a tube in the middle. So if you have torrential rain and hail, like we've had every day for as long as we can remember, well, all of May, I think they'd quickly get ruined because the tube would just sit with water in it. So I grow all of my plants um, on stands covered from the rain with sort of clear plastic tops. It keeps the worst of the rain out. It doesn't keep it all out, unfortunately. And when it snows, the snow blows in and covers them, but that's fine, they don't mind. Anyway, so that's a border auricula. This is another of my border seedlings. I don't know whether you can see that. It's my pickety ones with a little <laughs> purple edge, which I really like. It's got more of an oxlip sort of look that one I think smaller flower and the borders are a funny class actually this one is one of my favorites it's lavender lady and I certainly wouldn't put that in the garden because it's got lots of farina on the leaves and the farina is um, latin for flour as in baking flour and if you put water on this if you just splash a bit on it just ruins it it, it makes flour and water paste and it just smudges the flower and smudges the leaf and that one you can see I was talking about the carrot can you see there's a carrot uh, that yes. thick bottom that's the carrot and when I repot that I'll be putting it deeper in the pot in the autumn to cover that carrot and I'll also take off this little offset here at the side and that's how you generally reproduce auriculars they produce Sometimes one, if it's a show fancy, you can get 10 or more. And it's better to keep taking them off, particularly with the show fancies, because if you allow them to just keep producing offsets, they won't bother to flower because they'll just think, well, this is probably an easier way of reproduction. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we propagate them. I love getting into the psyche of a plant. <laughs> <laughs> Mind reading the auriculars. <laughs> Auriculars are divas, we've decided, I think. They, <laughs> yeah, they have a strange mindset. And I, on the borders, this is a ridiculous border and it shows what a mess border auriculars are. Um, this one is called Helen Rowan and it's, it's covered in farina. So if that got wet, it would look horrible. And the only reason it's been dumped in the border class is that it's got a pin eye and you can't have a pin-eyed primula in any other class of auricula. 
Now, this came up with Richard Hobbs when we were in yeah. his garden talking about pin eyes, and I got completely confused. People can go and check out Richard Hobbs' podcast in his garden. It was fabulous. <laughs> but I'm not sure that I uh, I came out of it completely illuminated about pin eyes, et cetera. So, yeah, oh dear. <laughs> I'm a botanist, but the pin eyes, it does literally look like there's a pin in the middle of that flower. You can see that little dot. Uh, whereas normally you'd get just the anthers. I don't know whether you can see that. There's a little yes, ring of yeah. one, two, five anthers. And the stigma, the pin, is is deep within the plant. Okay. So kind of that's the difference. It's all to do with reproduction. Don't ask me what. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go back to Richard. <laughs> Okay, so we've done the borders. So then you've got the doubles, which in my view are generally borders. Um, I would treat them as borders, but again, personally, I prefer to keep them in a pot. That one is a, you know, it's as you can see, it's got a really full head of flower. Probably if you were showing it, you'd have to break that down quite a bit. I'm not sure, because I don't show disclaimer. I don't show them. <laughs> it be too stressful. I just couldn't do it. Um, this one is called Sanctuary Wood. And it's, it's gold with this lovely little sort of slightly mauve edge on the flowers. It looks like uh, sugar work on a cake. Yeah, <laughs> that's one of my favourites. It's not a very double-double, but it's called Edith Major. And I find if I take seed from that one, I do get some really nice um, single borders uh, with the sort of mix of mauves and yellows. And this is another double, which has got rather nice speckling on it. And that I got from a flower show in France. I went to the Journée des Plantes at Corsan. I think it's somewhere else now. And I bought this beautiful basket. They make lovely baskets in rural France. And I filled it with these Barnhaven seedling auriculas. And it was just the best day. It was pouring in the rain, but I just didn't notice. I was so happy. <laughs> Anyway, that was a stunner. It's kind of sooty colored, that one, like a sooty yes. sky. It is. So then we come on to the alpine auriculas, which are probably the ones that people think of most when you say auricula. Um, this one is a gold centered alpine and it's called Andrea Julie. And if I was showing, I would have to get it so that all the petals were laying the same way. I've done that one and I just I can cannot yeah. imagine the stress of trying to do that whole head without tearing any of the tube because once you've done that you can't show it because you've messed it up so um yeah this is almost as stressful as showing chrysanthemums when you're doing the recurved chrysanthemums and they have a sort of a sharp needle just to pull the petals from behind <laughs> so they're all falling like a waterfall I know you have to sort of roll roll the petals round with a um, little kebab stick or a cotton bud or something. Incidentally, I stake mine using kebab sticks, which I paint <laughs> tasteful sage green. So that's a gold centered alpine. <laughs> I, I love it. That, well, no, I'm saying because this is so funny because it's surreal, isn't it? Jane Ann Walton, the <laughs> Famous grower of wonderful auriculas uses kebab sticks to stake her auriculas, <laughs> but she paints them a very tasteful shade of sage green. <laughs> Not fair and ball, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's far um, smarter than that. <laughs> so that's another alpine auricula, and it's got this typical thing that the alpines have of shading on the flower. So it's it's dark. Yeah. You've got the red face, then it's dark, and then it's got the lighter edge. Um, and this one is Argus, which actually dates back to 1888, I think. And it's quite remarkable that it's still flowering. A lot of the ones that I grow, I haven't seen a flower on them for years. And you think, do I chuck it out or not? Because, you know, they've been kept going for so long. And we kind of need the florists to keep bringing in new varieties. Um, so, so is it possible that you can somehow make it happy enough to flower again or has it just got a bit sort of old and tired? I think it's got old and tired. Um, some of 
some of the named auriculars, an auricular can only be named if it's won a prize at a national show, and then you will be invited to give it a name. And some of those named ones, you know, they'll flower for a, a year, a couple of years, and then nobody ever sees a flower again because they're just so happy just making lots more offsets and they think, why bother? And I don't think that the mild winters help because normally in a winter, the auricula gradually dies back and you pull the yellow leaves off as they die very gently to stop botrytis getting in. Um, so it, and all the goodness sort of goes down into the carrot and then it's ready to sort of burst forth in the spring. But if you don't get a decent cold winter, which we don't tend to get now, um, they don't die back. So they, again, they've got no threat to their existence. Why would I bother to send up a flower, you know? <laughs> we used to have an auricular day in Norfolk and our great friend, Fred Waite, who sadly isn't with us anymore, he had, I think about 7,000 auriculars when he died. He was head governor of Sandringham. Um, he'd been at Sandringham since 1948 and he was a when he retired they gave him a greenhouse and he thought what am I going to do with this and he started on auriculars and he became quite obsessed I think <laughs> and was a very good grower anyhow I started this auricular day um, in about 2000 uh, because we're so far from where the shows are and I just put out a message through the society if any Norfolk growers would like to come bring your spare plants. And Fred phoned me up and I'd never met him. And he said, uh, he said, oh, here having an auricular day. Can I bring a few plants? So I said, yes, have you got many? He said, a few. <laughs> well, Fred turned up on the day and he opened the back of his car and it was like the TARDIS. He'd never seen anything like it. Just the quantity of amazing plants that he brought. And um, I've digressed now. What was I actually going to tell you? Every year when we met the auricular day after that, because we carried it on for many years, the last one was in 2017, um, we'd sort of compare notes and Fred was always saying, well, we haven't had a winter. <laughs> and, you know, you do need that winter, I think, to get really good flower. Out of interest, did you have first dibs on that TARDIS-like car full of auriculars? Well, a little bit. There were one or two. <laughs> I did actually think, yeah, I need that. But the range of plants we had was incredible. I'll send you a picture. The last one we had, I had tables and tables of auriculars sort of snaking through the barns. And they were all sold in an hour. There was no, Ian Roof was walking around with a big crate of them. <laughs> it was wonderful. But between us, we had so many different cultivars, and that's the way to get new ones, really. Yeah. No, my I trouble is my... has quite a lot of auriculars, though Alan probably not as many as you have these days. Well, no, because thanks to Jane Ann, I was um, she very kindly gifted me um, quite a few auriculars. I mean, I think there were several hundred, was there not? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I kept um, about 400. <laughs> yeah, and I, I actually, I have to say, I, I got them through the winter; they were fine. But I didn't repot until I, probably January when I repotted. Mm. Um, and I thought, well, I'm doing this all wrong and all the rest of it. But I got my gritty mix re ready and I, I, I didn't wash the roots, I have to confess, because yeah. that I didn't, I didn't know about. Um, but they have been, I've been very pleased with what, what's happened this year. They've done very well for me. I have them in my um, greenhouse that's in the wall garden. Unfortunately, it faces south, which is not ideal for auriculars, as you yeah. know. Um, but it's got blinds that I pull down until somebody goes up there on a dull day and put, puts them up and then forgets <laughs> to pull them down again. <laughs> but I've, they've been, I mean, they're all finished now because, because yes. of being under glass and everything. But I, I have been very pleased with them. One thing I notice about some of the, um, the darker coloured varieties is the deepness, the richness, the fullness of the petals. The yes. colour, I can't explain. It's almost as if you've got is if you've got an oil painting and you've got un layers of paint underneath the top colour that are shining through. It's quite unbelievable. Yeah. The, the maroon, uh, the dark red one that you just showed, I could see it there. It's almost like yeah. lacquer coming through. It was absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, yeah, so that, that's my story with auriculars. And I have to say that um, I'm not... Well, there's one little thing I'm going to do, which I want to copy. It's, co it's completely copying uh, Sissinghurst. Um, in one of the sinks, they had a, a 
full of dark blue auricula. I can't remember the name, but it doesn't matter. But I've been trying to build up enough stock so that I can do that. Just one yes. variety, just full, and it was stunning. It was just a dark blue variety with a cream eye or a, a limey cream eye. Something Very like nice. Eden Blue Star. Something That's like the that. one. That's the one, Eden <laughs> Blue Star. Well done. <laughs> Well, that's one that now doesn't flower for me very often. So I don't know whether that one's perhaps gone past its best. There, there is quite a nice one available on eBay at the moment in quantity, if you have a look. Oh, what's oh. it called? It doesn't, it's an unnamed one, but it looks like quite a nice border auricula that would be all right outside. All right. <laughs> I shall um, you know, guess, what I'm doing, guess what I'm doing this afternoon. <laughs> So we've we've yeah. talked about borders. We've talked about doubles and alpines. alpines. Selfs show show auriculas now. Now these are the ones that they always say you should have in a greenhouse. Now I don't have a greenhouse, and to me, once they were in a greenhouse, they're in very intensive care, and I don't think I'd ever be able to go out shopping or anything else really because you know how hot greenhouses can get. The ideal greenhouse would be one that you took all the panes of glass out the sides and just had the roof, you know. Yeah. Um, for killers. I know several like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fred used to have a dog kennel, and Fred's dog kennel was wonderful. It had a like one of those clear, is it polypropylene corrugated roofs, um, wire mesh sides, and staging at sort of a sensible height, and um, that was perfect. It was because it was partly shaded, yeah, but light. You know what I mean? Yes. Um. Oh, and, and uh, we were talking about theatres. I once went to see Lady Mary Keane, the garden designer's... Yeah. Wasn't it garden... in Privy? Yes, that... exactly. Yes. <laughs> it was a converted Privy. Yeah. So, you know, you've got all those extremes from uh, Cork Abbey to Lady Keane's Privy. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, oh. so show auriculars. This is a show self. So what you've got there is... Um, just one colour, no shading, uh, lots of loose farina in the middle, which is the thing that gets ruined if they get splashed with water, which is why they tell you to keep them in a greenhouse. When I started, because I didn't have a greenhouse, I had um, masses of old window lights because we had to have all the windows replaced in the house. And I've had the window lights up on breeze blocks on the ground and I used to keep them there. But then when I got more and more and more auriculars it was just I was spending all day on my hands and knees and it wasn't very pleasant and the auriculars don't really like it because you don't get so much airflow at ground level so then I had my stands built and it was a lot easier for everybody <laughs> really <laughs> this is uh, another show self so we've got the the farina on the leaves and this one's called brick lane <laughs> is a nice Perfect lovely orange glow yeah um where does the self part of the show self come from i know this is probably a stupid question but i'm here to ask the stupid questions i don't know the answer uh, <laughs> i honestly don't know why they're called selfs <laughs> there we go it's our homework go and find out is it possible <laughs> because they are of one color and without streaks and shading i think it probably is yes mm -hmm. So then we come on to the show Stripes, and this is a stripe called Mrs. Robinson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, lots of farina in the middle and on the leaves. And this is another one called um, Crinoline, which is a rather lovely, my sort of colours, lilac and I was going to say that Jane Ann colour, it matches yeah. your card. It does. <laughs> It's like, um, like a faded Wimbledon combo of lovely sort of sage yes, green and lilac. Um, they are in the most a... extraordinary colours, aren't they? Whether it's like a really, uh, really dark chocolate cosmos esque colour, or the kind of greens and the silver farina. I mean, they are. They don't look real. <laughs> no, I know. Um, at one of the shows, someone came up to one of the stewards and said, "They're not real, are they?" And the <laughs> steward said, "No, we finished making them at six o'clock this morning." <laughs> And, and I've also had a chap come up to me at the um, Alpine show at uh, Wyndham and I was asked to do a display of auriculars. 
And he sort of looked at them and he looked at me and he said, what are you going to do about all that mould on them? <laughs> you don't really know what to say, you know? <laughs> oh, beauty really is in the eye of the beholder or, or the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, this is another mouldy one. This one is, I just love it because it's called Seen a Ghost. <laughs> and... Um, it is, there is a stripe underneath all that farina. <laughs> so then we get on to the show fancies. Um, that's where you've got a sort of green edge and a body color that isn't black. So this one is Nanki Nan. That's an that's amazing, cool. amazing yeah. thing. That, that's kind of Norwich City colors, yeah. isn't it really? It certainly is. Canaries are back. <laughs> I have, I have to say that I've never liked the combination of yellow and green on clothes or anything like that. But on no. that original, it just looks superb. Doesn't it? And I'm not good at growing the what's called the edges. And you can get green edges or grey or white edges. This is a green edge auricula. The body colour has to be black. And if you look at the back, you see it is black. Yes, yes. And you've got that green edge. But it's said that you can't grow a good edged auricula south of Manchester, so that's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda Hyatt used to manage it and she was, so, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> and this one is uh, Brookfield, which is the most reliable really of the gray edges. And there is masses of farina on that. The farina really is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it's it's something that, that obviously doesn't cope in natural conditions. You kind of wonder where on earth it came from. How did it ever come about in the first place? I, I Yeah, I guess it is a um, way of reducing transpiration, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. It would coat itself in that to sort of help it survive in... It's a protection probably against hot sun as well. Yes. I find it strange that it's these farinaceous ones that the red spider prefer. You'd think it would really be quite annoying if you're a red yeah. spider creeping out on it. They've also got little hairs on the leaves, which you can't see, but um, these are the ones to watch for red spider, particularly that lavender lady. It always gets it every summer, wherever I put it. But oh. the Nemo sort it out. Wow. Anyway, I think that, that's the auricular show and tell. I think that's the <laughs> that's the range of all the different classes, really. So if you're looking through a catalogue and you see it's a, a board or an alpine or a, a show, that kind of shows you the sort of range. Now, your auriculars are always displayed in the most beautiful terracotta pots. And now I don't know if you're always in pursuit of perfect auricular pots, if you've managed <laughs> to just acquire them over the years and whether or not they do better in terracotta versus plastic, but they certainly always look very fetching in your pots. Well, I do hate to see plastic pots on an auricular theater. I just think it kind of kills the look. <laughs> uh, and what I used to do at the start of repotting is I'd get the whole lot into alphabetical order because they'd be all over the place by the end of the season. And I'd pick out the best of each plant and put it in terracotta for next year's display. But I found the last few years with the hot summers, I was losing quite a lot of those best plants because the trouble with putting them in terracotta is, or growing them in terracotta is the terracotta dries out very quickly and then you're much more prone to getting trouble with red spider and leaf hoppers and this, that and the other and the root aphids. They all thrive in drier conditions. So now for the time being, I'm growing them all in plastic and then I cheat and I just put the pot in, a, in terracotta. That is so clever. <laughs> Not so easy to find terracotta pots that your plastic pots will fit into, actually. And I know everyone says, oh, you know, you mustn't use plastic in the garden, but I've got them now. I've used the same pots for 30 years. When Fred died, his widow very kindly gave me some of his pots. And those pots are going to see me out. I wash them all very carefully when I'm repotting, which takes forever. But, you know, we just use them over and over again and they don't seem to deteriorate. So that's fine. <laughs> must make life easier as well when you've got your plant in plastic within the terracotta the whole process must be easier yes and I think it possibly helps keep the roots a bit cooler as well when they're on the theatre 
because auriculars hate having hot roots and um, what you mustn't do when you're watering it on a sort of hot day is if you see them wilting, don't rush out and water them because they'll probably pick up by the evening. And we always water either very early in the morning or late in the evening when you can see whether the plant really needs it or whether it was just a bit stressed with the weather. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's true of lots of plants, isn't it, Alan? Yes, it is. I mean, plants will, will show their stress, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily terribly short of water. Um, yeah. It just means that they, they don't like the hot sun on them, and particularly plants that are shade lovers. Um, they just don't like it, and that's the end of it. No. Um, I, I can remember the first time I grew um, Myosa tidium hortensia, the Chatham Island forget-me-not. Um, I was uh, in the garden and I planted it, inadvertently planted it where it got the hot morning sun on it. And it normally has bright green, vein, very, very shiny leaves, almost as if they have been varnished. Mm. And uh, suddenly the leaves went dull and they just sort of flopped. And I thought, oh, it needs water. No, it didn't. It just didn't like the sun on it. As simple as that. I mean, I remember being at the Chelsea Flower Show and there was a, a garden which was um, uh, made by an, uh, a New Zealand garden designer and she was blagging on about her myosotidium hortensia. And I said, oh, I grow that in the garden. She said, what, well, in England? I said, yeah. She said, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> she said, no, you can't. It won't grow in England. And I said, well, I'll go and look at another garden, shall I? And off I went. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wish I could grow it. I just cannot get it to flower, Alan. What do I do wrong? Um, I tell you what I do with it. I actually give it a dressing of a seaweed granular seaweed fertilizer um, and I give it the dressing of that uh, late late summer I suppose around about September and again in February yeah um, and I think that that just kind of kicks it into life a little bit but it's hmm. a difficult plant it is one of those plants that uh, you know it, it's try it's a bit like good auriculars Jane Ann because they are difficult to grow let's not yeah say they're the easiest plants and when you have success I mean it's it just everything makes it all worthwhile but I mean it is uh, that's one of the yeah. two for me and complete shade but not overhead shade I grow them on the north side of walls or north side of buildings and places like that um, oh. so that they are again it's cool that they like c-o-o-l-t-h yes. that they like yeah. um, they just don't like our heat I absolutely love them I mean like your garden is the first place I ever saw one and sort of mm. I've been trying grow it ever since really and I used to grow them very well from seed but I don't seem to be able to get them to germinate now. No there's an awful lot of problems with the seed that is around on, on offer because a friend of mine who's a commercial grower he bought well he, he paid 80 pounds he got 80 pounds worth of seed I don't know how many seeds that brought him but he had mm. about 10 plants from that which makes them very expensive. Really? Yeah. Yes. So it's a mystery. <laughs> One day uh, Jane oh. I'm sure you'll be able to conquer it. Yeah I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I quite like the the idea of the, the auricular that you said, if you save seed from that, you get very promising progeny, which I think was rather nice. Yes, uh, yes, the, the yes. Edith Major, you will get yes. something, you know, uh, but they won't all be great. It's said that you should throw away 90% of your seedling. You, no, I, I don't. <laughs> I'm, not that because I'm not going to show them. So you would get, yeah. in, on a good day, you'll get something like that from this. Well, see, um, that I think is wonderful. It gives everybody this hope. Lavender Lady, I've had seed seedlings from that that are quite often a lovely pale lemon colour. Oh, again, amazing. I mean, the, the genetics of plants is quite incredible. Yeah. Um, how colours change and what, I mean, what's in the plant that makes the colour change? I don't know. It's, yeah. So right. if people have got, you know, a few auriculars and they're really keen to grow them from seed, what is the secret, Jane Ann? Um, I'm thinking about this but <laughs> what I do with most of mine is I actually do take the seed heads off because it's taking a lot of energy out of the plant and you want that energy to go back down into the carrot but if I've got one that I really want to try saving seed from I'll take off some of the pips so I haven't got too many ripening because then you're not wasting the plant's energy and you get a lot of seed with luck from a I've got 70 seedlings from one plant last year no idea what they'll turn out like we'll know next year um 
so mark with a bit of coloured wool the ones that you want to keep so you don't snip them off inadvertently. And while I think of it, you snip the flowers off just, just below the flower here and then leave the stem to wither and then pull it gently away when it's withered. If you pull it away straight away, you can leave a little scar that can then develop botrytis and the whole plant might go. So that's what you do. Um, you can either sow the seed fresh, which I do because I feel that's when the plant would have been sowing its seed. So that will be in August, I guess. And they can germinate in about four days. Um, if you don't sow it fresh, put it in a packet in a jar in the fridge and keep it cool, not the freezer, but the fridge, keep it cool and sow it early spring. But they don't need any heat. Um, they want to be in the light. I just put the seed on the surface of my um, seed compost and then put some of that chicken grit on top so that they've got a bit of um, the light can get in and they can get out. Um, and you should put them somewhere fairly cool in the shade and airy. They like air and some people actually put their pans of seed up on pallets just so that they've got air circulation right round. And apparently that helps the germination. But what they wouldn't like is for you to put them in a heated propagator or something like that. <laughs> they just wouldn't germinate. It's so tempting to do that, but it's, it's going right back to the very beginning where you talked about where they come from. It makes perfect sense that they'd want somewhere cool and shady and with lots of air circulation. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so then they just do their thing. You just leave them and, and hope. <laughs> yes. And when, when the plants get big enough, I will um, prick them all out. Um, again, I tend to do them in sort of wide, shallow pots to start with. Um, sort of, you know, perhaps five to a pot or something. And then pot them up individually when they're bigger. But all the time when you're growing auriculas, you don't want to what's called overpot them. Don't put them in too big a pot. Three inches is about your maximum, really. Perhaps three and a half inches for a border. Mm. And there will inevitably be people listening and watching who are completely enthralled by auriculars, but don't know where to get hold of them. And I am getting a vibe throughout this that it's quite niche and you're not really going to come across the sorts of ones you might be desperate to grow in any kind of garden centre. It is really difficult now. I think for a start, auriculars aren't a very viable thing to grow commercially because you're probably only going to get two or three babies off a plant each year and you know you've got to cultivate that for a year before you can sell it um so I used to buy a lot of auriculas from Joynton nurseries and sadly they've just retired they were up in Ripon um before they retired they must have done a deal with Wootton's in Suffolk and their plants went down to Wootton's um, and Wootton's published a list in the spring of the plants they had available and they were almost all sold out within 24 hours. Oh, God. There's quite a lot of demand at the moment. I think now Wootton's and there are a couple of other nurseries, I think Hillview Hardy Plants and Summerhill. Um, by and large, you have to put your name down on a waiting list and they'll email you if and when that cultivar becomes available. Wow. And again, there you can buy them on eBay, but I've no idea the quality of the plants yeah. and some of them are selling for a lot of money. And obviously, when you've talked about them, there are some which are just not going to be a beginner plant at all, possibly because of the farina or, or just because they're difficult. In your experience, are there any that would just be a good starting point if someone can get their name on a waiting list and get hold of one? Yeah, I think I would. I'd go for borders and... Um, if you're really keen, again, the best thing is to join one of the societies because um, if you can get to one of their shows when they start again, they the members can bring their plants to sell. So they'll be really good quality named plants because I don't know whether I've told you already, you can't name a plant unless it's won a prize. So mm. um, you can get those plants at the shows and also the Midlands and West section have the most amazing seed list and they're not all open pollinated like mine. They're um, deliberate crosses by people who know what they're doing. And I've had some lovely plants from their seed. They don't charge very much for it. And I think they sold us, sent out something like 8,000 auricular seeds last year all over the world. I mean, they've got um, 
quite uh, one or two members in St. Petersburg in Russia who actually have produced some wonderful plants from the seed and they actually put on a show of auriculas, which is quite something really. <laughs> and Barnhaven in uh, France have a collection of auriculas and you can buy auricular seed from them. But again, if you're not going to sow it straight away, put it in the fridge till you do. Well, as, as Lily Betts' appearance would, uh, would prove, we've had a, a quick break, but we're back with uh, yet more if fun auricular stuff to talk about. And before anyone worries, Lily isn't ill on the video version. She just keeps chewing her foot. So we've put her in the cone of shame and she's suitably <laughs> unimpressed. Um, but before we move on to a spot of Flomo, oh, the dog's joining me. Before we move on to Flomo, our uh, plants that we want to grow, which undoubtedly are going to have a certain auricular theme on this auricular special, I think you've got some rather exciting tools, or at least one exciting tool to share, yeah. Jane. This is tool Mo, how about that? <laughs> so this is a potting trowel, and I just love it for auriculars, because you don't want to be covering the little leaves with compost when you're potting, and it's um, one of those lovely Schneeber tools made in Holland. And it kind of funnels the soil down into the pot. It just works really well. So you sort of scoop the soil up and then funnel it in. I don't know whether Alan has one. Do you, Alan? I don't. I don't. It's, like it's not on the list, Jane Ann. <laughs> you need one. Definitely need one. And um, it's very thoughtfully available in a left-handed and right-handed edition for those left-handed people, yeah. which is good. And um, although I've got 700 odd auriculars, I water them with this little watering can with a tiny spout because again you can get the water under the leaves without throwing it everywhere Does so, that water, it where did you get your watering can is it a bog standard one or did that come from somewhere nice um this one's it's a horse one this one is an old one i think it now comes in silver with a rather nice little brass plaque on it but um so i did recently i lost this because it's quite small i keep putting it down forgetting where i put it <laughs> so I to, it's very useful <laughs> Didn't Richard Hobbs say he waters a lot of his more precious potted plants with an old coffee pot, Alan? Yeah, exactly. You, you yeah. Know, to get that, to get, well, I, I'll tell you something. I, we were in London the other day and we had afternoon tea. Um, and the tea, it was nothing special about the tea. It's just English breakfast with tea, but it was brought in this silver teapot with a long, narrow, curving spout. Yeah. And now you can see why ladies, when they serve tea, they did it so beautifully. Because this, <laughs> this spout just poured so wonderfully um yeah not sloshing great amounts into a mug but a small <laughs> amount into a delicate teacup there's a great deal of subtlety in it so I can see how it would work yes yeah, yeah. so if, if people don't have one of those watering cans they can just go and see if their coffee pot would do the trick yes, yes. absolutely or, or yeah. you know go to a, a vintage shop and buy one mm -hmm. of those lovely old silver plated teapots yeah um, yeah. Now, Jane Ann, you have got 700 auriculars, but when it comes to Flomo and the idea of things you want to get, are there still auriculars that you're after? Um, I do keep seeing them on Instagram and thinking, <laughs> oh, I like that. oh, I like that one. But, you know, you just can't get your hands on them at the moment. That's the trouble. So, um, yeah, I keep placing pathetic bids on them on eBay and then thinking, no, I'm not paying £20 for an auricular. <laughs> I've got 700. <laughs> I've got 700, yeah. <laughs> so Flomo wise, would you have something non-auricular related to bring to the party? I am trying to curb my Flomo because um, <laughs> you just can't get plants at the moment. As Alan was saying the other week, you know, the nurseryman just cannot supply the demand. What with the perfect storm of Brexit and COVID, I think the supply chain's been broken. It has, yes. I, I have to say I did um, I did put a big order in with scamps or big by my standards. I tried to be restrained, but after your um, wonderful episode with them, I was just, I thought I need, need more daffodils in my life. And then I thought, I know what's going to happen. You know, this big box is going to arrive in the autumn and I'm just going to think, where am I going to put them? So what I did is I made myself go out with a camera and photograph the spots where they were going so that I could see where I had got bulb free space because otherwise they come in the autumn and you end up chopping up the things that are already in the ground, don't you, by mistake, yeah. digging up bulbs to plant bulbs. So I've done that. And I did get very wistful when I saw Alan's picture. I think it was Alan's on Instagram the other day of um, the yellow Banksian rose. Oh, oh yes. I had 
yes. Yeah. And the honey fungus got mine. Um, and I just don't know where I could put another because they do need quite a lot of space, don't they, Alan? Yeah, they do. I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I've actually, should I say, got rid of mine in the front courtyard, but I'm looking at it now in flower at a, in a manageable state. It's, it's a tricky thing because I think it flowers best on its second wood, second year wood. So that if you prune it very hard in the autumn, you won't get flowers and, uh, for two years, if you see what I mean. Yes. Um, and I think that that was one of the mistakes that I made when I first had it. But then it did get very unruly for the area of wall that I had it. But yeah. at the moment, I'm managing to curtail its space. And it is rather charming because it just flowers so early. I looked on um, Instagram the other day and there was a wonderful picture of one covering the one side of the front of, I can't remember the name of the house now, it was Simon, um, goodness Home me. Hale. Yes, Home Hale Hall. Yes. Um, and I just love the fact that his mother, when she was alive, she used to get the, the rose taken yes. off the front of the house and laid down in, on the lawn yep. in front and she would prune it and then got the gardeners to come back and put it up again. <laughs> I bet they love that job. <laughs> what, a, what joy, you know, years ago, I mean, poor people are probably not earning very much, but, you know, the joy of having yeah. all the people to do those jobs. Yeah. yeah. It's we a wonderful rose. Yeah, yeah, we do. It's a wonderful <laughs> rose. If people don't know it, just these gorgeous little clusters of flowers and they're such a warm, buttery, light, lemony foil for other plants as well. They're mm -hmm. just great. Of primrose oh. colour, really. Yeah, yeah I don't they know. Are. You've seen it, Alan. There's a wonderful house in Dedham. And um, this time of year, every year, I used to go down to Beth Chateau's with friends yeah. and we used to stop for tea in Dedham on the way back because there's lovely tea rooms. And there's a wonderful house there that's got a big wisteria and a yellow banksy and rose and the two flower together. And you've got the, the lemon and the soft lilac and it is just... Yeah. Well, that's exactly that's exactly how it is at home hail because they have wisteria on one side of the door and the banks in rows on yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's absolutely charming. I am going to try one though, growing through a tree. I spoke. I mean, you know, the one thing about the banks in rows is it's it was slightly tender. I think when we had real winters, sometimes they used to get cut back or even killed, um, and always needed the backing of a warm wall if to to grow yes. out its best. But I was speaking to Richard Hobbs the other day about it, and we were talking about the possibility of it growing into a tree. And I was wondering, in the light of the fact that our climate is now, shall we say, slightly better, although this winter has been a bit colder than most recently, I think it, I might try it growing into a tree and see how well it does there. Hmm. Yeah. Who knows? We've got to try these things. Yes. <laughs> and you mentioned it flowering on its, its older wood. Um, does that mean you should, or when should you prune it? Well, I think I, I think if anybody's got a banks in rose, they would prune out the older wood so that if you've got, shall we say, let's try and illustrate this. Any wood that it produces, long shoots that it produces in 2021, at the end of 2021, I would take the old flowers shoots out and those shoots that have been growing for the whole of this year will then flower next year. So that it will be their second year of growing, if you see what I mean. That's what I think I'm trying to say. So you remove a, portion, a proportion of the old flowered wood every year, making sure that you've got something uh, coming along to, to re replace that removal with a new shoot if possible. If you can't do that, well, I would leave the old shoot in place, but prune those spurs back to one or two buds in the hope that they would produce more flowers the following year. Mm. I must confess, you've now given me a whole new flow, Mojane Jane Ann, because um, I, I've got one of those in my parents' garden, but I haven't got one here, and now I'm really rather regret regretting that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to, to bring one with me. Um, on, a, on an auricular front with Flomo, I went through your Instagram just looking at things like, things I could never have, but things like Starling with all of its, it's so aptly named with all of its speckles. I mean, that is, that's a style. Yeah. Um, and it, crimple yeah crimple's gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> I think starling is one of those auriculars that actually looks better on a macro lens than it does in real life you'd walk past it in real life and not notice it but if you really go in close and look at the speckles it is fantastic there were there were lots things like blue chip Kingfisher looked a little bit more attainable because it didn't seem to be quite yeah. so greenery. But uh, but yeah, I, I I thought, well, I'll look through and I'll pick out one. <laughs> yeah, that was a fool's <laughs> errand, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and 
and Sanctuary Wood, which you've still got on on screen, yeah. in the version of this yeah. podcast. Yeah. I mean, that really does look edible. Yeah, it does doesn't it? So that's that's a stunner. But actually, on a non auricular front, and I didn't write down the name of it, but you have, do you have a green flowered? Japanese quince and I've is it canomalies yes. anomalies however we want to say it I, I mean uh, kunshidan spelt with a k yeah I'm glad you said I think it. I can think it's kunshidan do you have it Alan no I don't but I, I've just written it down kunshidan kunshidan oh, kunshidan kunshidan it's on my Instagram page I just mm. can't quite remember its name but as Japanese quinces go it's a slow one which can have advantages you don't have to be pruning it every 5 minutes and it's a double okay. lime green and it's really pretty yeah yeah i've never seen that before until you posted a photo of it and um well i wrote on it i wrote something on it and you said ah future yeah. flomo <laughs> and here it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> can oh. I help out <laughs> So, Alan, then on a Flomo front, uh, aside from a lime green Japanese flowering quince and seven well, auricular. I know. Um, well, you, I've already told you about the Eden blue auricular that I'd like to increase my, the quantity of. And Jane Ann has put me in um, uh, onto the eBay to look for a dark blue border auricular, which is absolutely fine. And I shall do that. But... <laughs> One of the things that I'm happening in the garden here is, I mean, Jane Ann, you will appreciate as, a, as being a gardener of a fine gardener, if I may say so, for many years. Um, I particularly remember a lovely little double violet that you put up on Instagram that was given. I mean, this is tantamount to your cleverness or whatever, but you were you 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 acquired given or whatever that many years ago, and it's you've still yes. got it in the garden today. Um, and I, one of the things I'm trying to do with the garden here is each time I move into an area um, to refurbish and to cut back and hack back and do what we do, I'm trying to un, um, replace some of my what I call ordinary plants with much more unusual plants. And this is where Kunchid and Quince comes in, because that is obviously quite an unusual plant. Um, and the other one from today is, of course, those wonderful florist tulips which I think I'm going to have to become a member of the Wakefield Tulip Society. I think you might. <laughs> it made me smile when I first joined. Um, they, they send out ever so late. I mean, I think February one year, the bulbs arrived. Oh, goodness. And they were in um, anodin packets. And I thought, is this a sign? <laughs> Little tiny but anodin boxes, headache pill boxes with these tiny bulbs in. And I planted them and I, I'm pretty sure some of them did flower that year. You yeah. just have to be patient and you have to lift them every year. You dry them off and then you put them in the sun for a while when they're dry to kill any um, tulip fire on the bulbs. And then yeah. plant quite late, second week of November, the week of the Lord Mayor's show apparently is traditional. <laughs> That's the way of remembering it, isn't it? It's like a yeah. box on Derby Day. It's just That's the right. way of remembering, or the Chelsea Chop, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so there you are. That is my my flomo. It has to be those florist tulips, um, and to actually join the Wakefield Tulip Society, and I might even join the National Perimula and Auricular Society, <laughs> Midland <and> West. <laughs> I think you should, Alan. definitely. It's only about fifteen pounds, I think. Well, that's, well, well. That, that's a bargain isn't it because we we you know you make friends increase your knowledge and hopefully increase the am amount of plants that you have then the enjoyment yeah. that you provide but well, you get provided with but you provide everybody else with as well yeah i think it's right. lovely to, to especially when you open your garden to visitors like i do um it's nice for them to see unusual things and it's also nice for them to see perhaps plants such as auriculas whatever forms they are uh, in a nice theater looking wonderful Yes, yes. And if they can't make it to Alan's garden or anywhere else, at least they can look at your wonderful Instagram, Jane Ann. And, uh, <laughs> and basically every day at the minute, you are showing us another stunning auricula alongside all of your other fantastic plants. Um, so thank you for putting all the effort into that because it just gives us such inspiration every day. That's a pleasure. It's, it's nice to share it, actually. And yeah, yeah um, I do find opening the garden very stressful. This is a much calmer way of sharing my garden with people <laughs> and people all over the world. You know, I've made sort of virtual friends in Australia through the auriculars, Canada, 
the states all over yeah it's wonderful it's a whole international gardening community it is yeah well do come back again i know your garden is always offering up treasures whatever the season so we'll catch up on a future episode but what a joy to have an auricular special wonderful <laughs> happy gardening <laughs> happy Thank gardening you. everybody bye bye, bye, -bye. Jane. Hey, your parakeet necklace on i have i have haven't worn jewelry for ages i've kind of almost forgot i had any <laughs> well i'm wearing an old jumper that comes from the ark <laughs> They've all got. Hang on a minute. Hang on, hang on a minute. Can we have this on air? Because I, I think it's interesting. I know it's, it's getting more and more interesting. <laughs> the squirrels are just out of control. If um, the left don't get you, then the right one will. <laughs> In the morning, if I haven't got the bird feeders full, the squirrels wreak their revenge. And now they've started on Virginius. And they literally sit up in the beech tree throwing Virginia stems down on <laughs> like I go past.